Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of Mr. Carlson's Lab. In this video, we're going to take a look at a very interesting device, a device that really isn't all that well known. This is a vacuum tube op amp, and these things were used in some of the very first computers. I managed to find a brand new device in the box, so what we're going to do is take a look at this device, and then we're going to power it up and see how well it works. I can tell you this, the power requirements for a vacuum tube op amp are a little bit higher than a solid state op amp, about 580 volts higher. So I'm going to have to make a power supply for this as well. So this should be a very interesting video. Let's get started. Most of us today are familiar with op amps that look like this right here. So this is a standard 14 pin dip. And in this package here, there is only one op amp. So before op amps looked like this, now they're a lot smaller as well. They're in surface mount packages and things like that. They looked like this right here. So I'll just open the case. Comes in this nice little case. It's for when you want to build your analog computer. There it is. Let's take this out of the box. So it looks like somebody's looked at this before. You can see that there's some smudging on the writing on the vacuum tubes. This white writing on the vacuum tubes now is almost like a powder. So if you just rub it with your finger, a lot of the times you'll take that off. So if you find any older vacuum tubes like this with white writing on them, you don't want to rub them. And definitely if you're cleaning the tube or something like that, if the glass is really dirty on the vacuum tube, you want to clean around the lettering. You don't want to actually touch any of it because this stuff will just wipe right off just like that. So it's not too bad, you know, considering its age. They both look to be original parts. So this is most likely the vacuum tubes that came with this device. It looks very, very clean. So you'll notice on the bottom here, it has an eight pin octal socket and the high voltage and signal and heater voltage and everything goes into this right here. So what I'm gonna have to do is get an octal socket, plug it onto the bottom here and solder some wires onto the socket so we can actually test this thing. And I'm gonna also have to put that very high voltage power supply together so that we can operate this op amp. So what I'm going to do first is I'll go get some schematics and a diagram of this thing and we'll take a look at that and how we have to wire this thing up and we'll take a look at the actual voltage requirements. This is the first of two data sheets for the model K2-W operational amplifier or op amp if you prefer. Now, way back when, this is a pretty fancy device. It reads here, among the many feedback operations which the K2-W will readily perform are addition, subtraction, integration, differentiation, multiplication, division, inversion, impedance conversion, and the injection of current. So you can bet if a radio or television repairman came across this thing way back in the day, they would think this thing is magic. So what we're interested in here is the base pin connections, which is right down here. So in order to wire this thing correctly, let's grab the op amp here. In order to wire this thing correctly, we need to locate pin number one and wire this thing up, plug this thing into an octal type tube socket. This is an octal type base. So to give you an example of a really common octal type base that you would find on a tube that's still in production today is the 6L6, the 6V6 tubes, things that you'd find in guitar amplifiers and things like that. Uh, the 6SN7, 6SL7, 5R4, you know, vacuum tubes like that. They all have octal sockets on it. So you know, really common, really, really common. So in order to locate pin number one, we first have to locate the index pin. This is the index pin. So that only allows us to plug this thing into the tube socket one way. So if, if that index pin wasn't there, we could plug it in like this or like this or like this or any way around, right? So this allows us to basically just plug it in correctly. So a lot of the times with tubes, what you can do is put the tube on the top of the octal tube socket, put a little bit of downforce and rotate the tube and it'll just go, kind of go chunk and fall into place. So with this particular tube socket here, we have our, you know, really pronounced index pin. In order to locate 
pin number one, we count from this side of the index pin and we count clockwise. So this is pin one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So if we look here, pin one, which would be on this right here, all right, pin one is the positive input, which is a signal input. Pin two is the negative input, again, signal input. Pin three is negative 300 volts DC. So that's one of our supplies. That's our negative supply. Pin four is ground, chassis ground or reference. Pin five is positive 300 volts DC. So from rail to rail across this op amp, we have 600 volts. So pin six is the output. Pin seven and eight are the heaters, which are 6.3 volts AC or DC. Now, if we look at these vacuum tubes here, you'll see that the vacuum tube says 12 AX7A, another really common vacuum tube that you find in guitar amplifiers and they're still available today. Now, 12 in the vacuum tubes number here is the heater voltage of the vacuum tube. So we have the heater voltage. AX is a, a factory designation. Seven is the amount of useful elements in the vacuum tube, and this is the A version of the tube. So since we know that 12 is the heater voltage of this vacuum tube, it's actually 12.6 to be exact. What they've done is they've installed inside the vacuum tube a center tap in the heater. So we can operate these tubes at either 12.6 or 6.3 volts. And that's what they've done is they're using that center tap here to operate this at 6.3 volts. Why? Because 6.3 volts is an extremely common heater voltage that's used in pretty much anything with vacuum tubes back in this day. The reason that they made these tubes capable to run at 12 volts is because you could use this in an automotive application. So if you, if your car radio needed a 12 AX7 in it, this would one run directly right off the battery. You wouldn't need to put a resistor in line with the heaters, or you wouldn't need to put a bunch of tubes in series. These would just run directly off 12 volts. And it's the common with uh, a lot of uh, larger transmitting tubes as well. Like the 6883 is a 12 volt heater version of a 6146, which is a really common RF output tube for way back when. Things like that. So they made tubes run in an automotive or, you know, some form of mobile application. And they would also make the same version of the tube. Sometimes they put a heater tap in it or they would make another version of the tube that's just at 6.3 volts. It's something that they did way back when. So at any rate, kind of drifting away from the op amp here a little bit. So what we want to do is make one of these configurations so that we can make this op amp work. There is another sheet here. We can take a look at the schematic at what's inside this. Now, way back when engineers loved to make things confusing because it added a little bit of, it made it kind of uh, magic and things like that. You know, when the normal repairman, television radio repairman would look at this and go one and he would go 4.7. Normally that's one ohm, like you would think nowadays and 4.7 ohms, whenever you see nothing behind it, well, no, that's meg ohms. So this is one meg ohm. This is 4.7 meg ohms. See how this says 0.22? So that's 0.22 of a meg ohm. So in today's speak, that's 220k ohms. All right. So 220k ohms, 220k ohms. They were nice enough to put K after this one here. So it's 10K. And we can see here 270K ohms. We have a neon bulb in here. This is how you draw a neon bulb inside here. And as you can see, it's rated 125 volts is the voltage at this point here. 0 0.68 is 680K ohms, things like that. Now, nanofarad was not a standard scale for capacitors way back when you would just not use the nano scale at all. It went from picofarad to microfarad. And if you use the nanofarad scale, well, way back when that was just strange. So when you see 7.5, that's 7.5 picofarad, 7.5 picofarad up here, 500 picofarad down here. Now, here's another thing. This is not really 
this is the way they did some schematics way back when, right? They did them like this, and sometimes they're even a little bit more confusing. Again, the engineers, it's almost like they like to play games with people back then over the simplest of things. So it would have been so much easier just to put Meg on here, kind of like what they did down here. So you can see what they're doing, right? It's just silliness. So to give an example for the capacitors again, going back to the capacitors, 0 0.0068 microfarad would be 6,800 picofarad. So you go from either one scale to the other. So you would go, say, if you had a 1,000 picofarad capacitor, that's 0 0.001 microfarad. There was no nanoscale in there at all. They just didn't do that way back when. So nanofarad is something that's used a lot more common now. So you can see here they have... See, they, they're, this particular op amp needs some form of a bias. So what we're going to have to do is create a bias supply for this thing as well. And chances are I'm going to do that with a couple of batteries just to keep things easy. So they have Mallory RM1s, which are kind of like a large style button cell battery. So probably just used a couple of AA batteries and just do it like that. Maybe put some wires on them and use them for bias. Oddly enough, you wouldn't want to run this bias situation in any kind of a you know fixed environment because you have a 100k ohm resistor right across these two batteries. After a while, it's just going to drain those, those little bias batteries dead, right? So up here, they have a resistive method of bias, principally for positive input, obviously, because they're you know taking the wiper and running it right to the positive input right here. You see pin 1 and pin 1. So what they're doing is they're taking a 1 meg ohm resistor and a 10k ohm potentiometer here and they're making a voltage divider. So the 1 meg ohm resistor connects right to pin 5, which is the positive 300 volts DC. It runs over here through the potentiometer and then to pin 4, which we can see is ground reference right here. The wiper of this runs down here to pin number 1, which is the positive input, you know, again, for principally for positive input. So we can run the wiper up and down the VR here in order to adjust the bias. And that might be one of the things that we just give a try here. Either that again, or I'll put some batteries together. So just depending on what configuration we use and everything. Now, they made this kind of nice. So if you were to look at the bottom portion here again, you can see the index pin and then pin 1. You can see the index pin here and pin 1. And this is kind of a nice little drawing that they've done. So they were friendly with a couple of things other things not so friendly with. So you can see the pin out here. So that makes things relatively easy to, to wire up here. Now the thing is, I have a positive 300 volt supply right there. I don't have a negative 300 volt supply. The negative supply on that device will only go up to negative 250 volts. So I'm going to need to put together a negative 300 volt supply. Now, Ultimately, in a situation where this thing was going to be in a fixed environment, you would want a positive regulated 300 volt supply and a negative regulated 300 volt supply. In this case, I'm just going to get 300 volts and get it as close to 300 as possible and we'll just use that for testing purposes. We're not going to get too incredibly accurate here and, you know, make regulated supplies just to, you know, basically mock this up and try this out, right? So what I'm going to do here is go look around for some transformers and uh, I'll go dig through area number three and see what I can find and I will be back quite shortly. This transformer has a 420 volt secondary winding with a center tap in it. So that's 210, 0 and 210 volts. So rectified and filtered knowing Hammond and hopefully the transformer works. It's, I just grabbed it and put it here. Knowing Hammond, I'm probably going to come out really close to 300 volts with this and some solid state rectifiers. So this was intended to be a B plus transformer way back in the day. It has a five volt winding. It says five volts at three amps. Hopefully you can see that. So this is a filament winding for a rectifier tube. And then this is the high voltage winding. So each end would go to one plate in like a 5R4 or 5U4. And then the center tap would run to the chassis. And this configuration, since we're making a negative supply, the positive output of this will attach to the ground 
of my other power supply and we're going to be using the negative as the feed because it has to be negative 300 volts and I'll explain a little bit more about this there's a very easy way to understand positive and negative power supplies just using two batteries and I'll show you that here in just a little bit so I'm thinking hopefully I'm going to come out around 300 volts with this transformer here so not only do I need a transformer I'm going to need two rectifier diodes as well. So I'll take these diodes and put them here on these terminals here. I'll show you how this is all wired. And then after this, I'm going to need a filter capacitor. That should give me enough filtering. And of course, it's going to store quite a charge. But that should be just fine with these two rectifier diodes. And again, you know, this is just a mock-up circuit. So it's you know, not regulated or anything like that. And it's just really to test this thing to see if it works. So that is a lot of filtering. I'm not going to have any ripple on this supply. So what I'm going to do now is get this thing all put together. And once I have this all wired up, it'll be really simple to wire up super quick to put this together. I'll be back and we'll take some measurements and see if this thing makes 300 volts or not. Here's the very simple power supply that should give me very close to the 300 volts that I need to make this op amp come to life. Now, do not try this at home. This creates a lot of voltage and current, and this is extremely dangerous. This is just for my testing purposes. Leave the scary stuff to me. So I've added one component. I wanted to add a bleeder across the capacitor here because without a bleeder across the capacitor, the capacitor is going to remain charged for a very long time. Now, this is a very, very light load across this capacitor. You know, this is just going to get gently warm. But over a period of time, it is going to bleed this capacitor down instead of, you know, allowing it to remain charged for weeks or months or whoever how long, depending on how badly this capacitor leaks. And this is a pretty high quality capacitor, so it's going to hold a charge for a very long time. 470 microfarad charged up to 300 volts is scary. So we definitely want to get rid of that charge when this is shut off. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get a line cord and I'm going to plug this into my isolation transformer and variac supply and we'll see how close to 300 volts this comes. All right, I'm just about ready to try this out. So what I'm going to do is take my line cord. Again, do not try this at home. So I'm gonna attach this to the zero and to the 124 volt tap because the line voltage here is a little high. So that's about the max here. Now I'm not even gonna bring this thing up. Just move this thing over to the side here. I'm not gonna bring it up slowly or anything like that. I'll just turn the thing right on. So how many volts do you think we're going to come out with? So this is reading the DC voltage right here, right across that capacitor. So mark down your guesses now. And here we go. Not too bad. Coming up to 298 volts. Not bad at all. So if I turn a light off here or something like that, maybe that, let's see if we can get it right to 300. Turn this light off. Almost to 299. See what else can I trim off on my bench here to see if we can get the line voltage up just a little more. See if we can hit 300. This one off. I think that one might be on a separate circuit. This one. Nah, not doing anything. So that's about it. Not bad. Oh, 299. Somebody in the neighborhood shut off their stove. Not bad at all. So there we go. Ah, there we go. 300 volts right there. Of course, you know, again, this is unregulated, right? So imagine applying a slight amount of load to this is going to bring that down just a little bit. Now the op amp takes about five milliamps, which is basically nothing. So right around 300 volts, that came in extremely close. Now, if I want to up this, I could put that tap onto the 117 and it's going to go above 300. So 
if say the op amp loads it down just a little bit and drags it down, going to the 117 volt tap is going to bring that up quite a bit. So what I'll do is I'll just shut this off and you can see how incredibly slow that's gonna drain off. So, you can see it's gonna take a long time for that to come down. So, if I go over here and grab this device, this is a device that we've put together on Patreon, and this allows to discharge capacitors very fast and safe. So this little device right here, you can see, so if I go across here, to here, see how quickly that brings that down? Now because of absorption, watch this, there's no nothing applied to this capacitor. This is what makes capacitors scary and a lot of people don't realize this. Watch what happens, even though this has a bleeder, I'll remove this. Look what's happening to the voltage. There's no power applied to anything. Even with a bleeder, it's climbing back up again. And sometimes, depending on the capacitor, they can climb up to a very scary level. So we're already over a volt. So that could keep climbing for a while. 1.3. So what I'm gonna do now, since this is not attached to anything, I'll move this over to the 117 volt tap and we'll see how many volts we get here now. So I'll turn this back on here. There you go, 317. So just by moving that over, that comfortably brought that above 300 volts. So with a little bit of load, we're probably going to come in very close, either or, either way. So it gives me a little bit of, a little bit of movement. And if I want, you know what? I could even adjust the variac a little bit and just bring it right down. Now again, this isn't going to be too incredibly important. We're just, you know, playing with an op amp here and making the thing do what it's supposed to do. Again, if this thing was going to be an extremely accurate service, we would want to regulate its supplies. Now, the positive supply I have is regulated. That's the uh, larger supply that's over there. That is regulated, this isn't. But again, you know, for testing purposes, this will be absolutely fine. So, I'll disconnect the power again. And I'll use my safe discharging device. That's gonna be hooked up either way here, here. You see how quickly that discharges that capacitor? Now, one thing that is really safe to do after this is done is when you're working on a circuit like this. Now, this is there's kind of a catch to this. You can't forget that you've done this. So this is way down there now. So now that this is that low as you can see it's going to want to climb back up again so what you can do is take an alligator clip and put it across the capacitor just like that and that'll keep it safe so if you're working on a power supply and you have capacitors that have bleeders on them but they're you know they're large capacitors like this as again you'll see that they you know, tend to charge up right so just shorting the capacitor while you are working on the device, of course there is no power applied to the circuit, is a safe thing to do. Now this is only 470 microfarad, you know, you can see that this is, you know, not all that big of a capacitor. You know, I have capacitors that are like this, you know, they are just, you know, half look like small paint cans. Now you can imagine the amount of charge that that would hold and some of these larger capacitors go to 450 volts. So, you know, discharging a capacitor and keeping it at a safe level, especially a capacitor of that size, you know, putting a, a shorting bar across it while you're working on a circuit after it's been safely discharged is a very wise thing to do. Again, as you can see, they want to charge back up. So we'll get rid of this here. As you can see, look at that. It's already trying to climb back up again. And that's due to a thing called absorption inside the capacitor. So I talk all about this stuff and, you know, we've d built this capacitor discharge unit to safely discharge capacitors and it has a bunch of extra leads on this side that can be plugged into another meter so you can actually watch the discharge on an external meter. So there's two sources that you can watch to make sure that the capacitor is discharging correctly, kind of a safety feature. 
So all that stuff is up there if you're interested in that. That was done not too long ago. So at any rate, what I'm going to do now is rig up a circuit with this. Actually here, what I'll do is I'll explain how a positive and a negative supply works first. Very simple with two batteries. I'll go get those right now and I'll be right back. Here's a very easy way to understand how a negative and positive supply can dwell within one chassis. And in order to understand this, we're going to use two fresh 9 volt batteries. So you'll notice that each of these 9 volt batteries are two completely separate power sources, yet each one is a 9 volt power source. Actually about 9.5 or 9.6 because they're fresh batteries right now. Now, in order to understand how a negative and positive power supply can operate within one chassis, this is going to be our, our mock-up chassis here, all right, is what we're going to do is take these two batteries and put them together like this. So if these were both 9 volts exactly, we would have 18 volts from end to end because these are in series now, right? So take a look at the meter here and... I'll test the battery from end to end. So now this is going to be about 19 point something volts because these are fresh batteries, right? So you go 19.35 volts, right? So that's end to end. Now here's where the trick comes in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take these batteries apart again, just like this. Again, we have two separate batteries. And what I'm going to do is take a wire and put a wire right in the center here. So between the two power sources, so I'll just clip this, try and get this together in here with this wire pinched. See if it'll take it. Usually these are pretty tight. So there we go. So now we have two batteries and right in the center of these batteries, so we have two series connected batteries right in the center where they join, we're going to connect this to the chassis here. So I'll grab an alligator clip off the side here. And I'll just clip this to the chassis like so. So this would be the chassis ground here. So now if I take the negative lead, right, because this is our chassis, and I go to the positive side of the battery, what am I going to get? 9.6 volts, right, because it's a fresh battery. Now what happens if I go over to this side? What do I get? Negative 9.6 volts. So I have a positive and negative supply. All I'm doing is I'm taking the center where they're connected in series and connecting that to the chassis through this alligator clip here. So you can see, if you look at the center where this is connected, the center of this battery here is positive, whereas the center of this battery here is negative. So you can see now how we can have two power supplies with one connection to the chassis and we can get a negative voltage, negative 9.6. You can see the little negative symbol right here, right? Negative 9.6 volts. And positive 9.6 volts. It's just that easy. And that's how power supplies work. And that's why transformers are so incredibly important in power supplies. It's because they isolate one supply from the other. They have separate windings in the transformer, so you can make multiple power supplies out of one transformer with lots of different windings. Again, this is why transformers are so incredibly important. Same thing in switch mode power supplies. You have a smaller transformer, it's just that it has multiple windings in it as well, and it also isolates the line side from the secondary side. Just that simple. Just that simple right there. So it's the same thing with this larger power supply that I put together. It's isolated because it's its own power transformer. So what I can do is I can take the positive of that supply and attach it to the negative of my other power supply, just like I've done here. And I'll have a negative 300 volt supply and a positive 300 volt supply. Just that easy. I have all the power supply leads wired up to the op amp now. So they're attached to this octal socket here and the op amp just plugs into that. So the green leads that you see here are the filament leads that lights up the filaments in the tubes. And we'll take a look at that here in a moment, make sure that the tubes actually light up. This orange lead that you see is the positive 300 volt supply. The white lead is chassis ground or just ground, common. And the yellow lead is the negative 300 volt supply. So from this yellow lead to this orange lead over here all have 600 volts. 
add a lot of current and you can bet I am not going to be touching this socket when that voltage is applied. There's quite a bit of current there too, so enough current to seriously hurt me. So I gotta be very careful around this. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just gonna turn on the filaments. Let's see if these tubes light up. I don't even know if these tubes are working. Hopefully the filaments aren't busted in them. So I'll just zoom on in here, get as close as I can. And we wanna keep an eye right in this little area right here. You can see the little filament wires, those two little filament wires there. See if we can get any glow out of this vacuum tube. So I'll get rid of some of the lights here. And I think that should, yeah, that should give us enough to see the filament. So here we go. Filament supply on. Ah, they're lighting up. That's a really good sign. Now, of course, there's a lot of other tests for tubes, internal shorts and things like that, but we're off to a good start. And I'm thinking since this thing is so incredibly, well, things almost mint, I'm thinking that it's probably gonna work just fine. So it looks really good. Everything's all lighting up inside there. See on the top there, if we can, little tops, little cathodes lighting up there. That one there. And this one here's got a really heavy getter compound on the top, so we really can't see in the top of that one, but we can see that they're lighting up down here. And that is a really good thing. So the tubes are alive in that sense. So now what I'm gonna do is zoom this back out here again. So what I'll do is I'll test the high voltage. Now I've put different leads on my meter here to do this just because I gotta be very careful prop this up just a little bit, Keep the glare off the screen. All right, so I'll get this over here and I'll turn this over maybe, well, if I'm very careful, I can see the lead pretty clear over here, so it should be okay. Doesn't look like that in the camera, but it's a nice clean shot to that positive lead there. So I've got these probes that have got insulation right up to the tip here. Even this is insulated right here. And whenever you're testing something with high voltage, you wanna make sure that you have an appropriate probe lead. The other probe leads, if I, do I have them here? I do have them here. So the other probe leads, just move these over here. As you can see, the other probe leads have a lot of exposed area. And if you come in and you accidentally touch something, I am going to short a 300 volt supply and that's not good. So definitely don't wanna do that. So I want to keep my vision intact here. So here we go. So I'll turn this on. So I'll turn on the negative 300 volt supply first. And I'll turn on the positive 300 volt supply. So here we go. So I'll move the focus over. And so I can get that better focused on the actual meter itself. There we go, here we go, let's check this out. So the negative of my meter is going to go right here, the positive is going to go here, and we should have positive 300 volts, there it is, positive 303 volts. And I'll go to this one and we should have negative 300 volts, and we do. And now if I go from end to end or rail to rail, we should have 600 volts. There it is, 605 volts across the op amp. So now what I'm gonna do is rig together a circuit and see if this thing amplifies or whatever we choose it to do. We'll figure that out here in a moment. I'll choose something nice and easy just to get this thing going. I have the op amp all wired up in a configuration that's going to allow us to see if this thing is going to do math correctly. So we're going to make some vacuum tubes do some math. Now, the configuration is really just this wide range amplifier that they've got drawn here. Nowadays, it's known as an inverting amplifier. So it's this configuration here just modified, and I'll draw that up in just a moment. That will really allow us to narrow this thing down. We can change a few values and things like that, and we can make sure this thing is actually really doing math correctly. First of all, I'll explain what I've got done here. So I've got a bunch of bias batteries here. It's a little more biased than it calls for, but no big deal because I can adjust that out.
out with this VR here. And on top of that, this is really to adjust DC error. This is going to be AC coupled into an oscilloscope, so we're really not going to notice that. I'll show you what this does here in just a little bit, how this will adjust that out. I have two resistors across here, which will fix the gain of this thing right now. And that's what's going to tell us if this thing is going to do math. And then what I'm going to do is change one resistor on here to a different value and see if it will do math there as well, just to make doubly sure that this thing is doing math correctly. I've got a pigtail kind of hanging off here right now, and this is where I'm going to clip all my grounds. The reason that I want this hanging off the side is because this runs right between two 300 volt supplies, and I do not want to be clipping anything in there. So that makes things quite a bit more comfortable for me. So all my grounds for my signal generator and scope and everything will just clip to this area here. So what I'll do is I'll get this out of the way here. I will grab some paper and I'll draw this up. So this is what we're going to do. So this is our op amp right here. This is our vacuum tube op amp. That's the output. All right, so we're gonna attach a resistor to here. And we're also gonna have a resistor here. This is gonna run down to our bias, just like this. And I will have a fixed battery here. This is this 4.5 volts worth of battery right here. So this is a 100K VR. That'll allow me to adjust the bias. This is the positive end. This is the negative end. This end here goes to ground. I'll run this over here. Our signal source will be over here. So this is just a standard signal generator. That will be here. Now, in order to make this thing do math, we set these two resistors. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this resistor 10K and I'm just gonna leave that at 10K. So this resistor here is going to be 30K. So our feedback resistor here. So if we have a 10K resistor here, feed the signal into it and we have a 30K resistor here, we have a gain of what? A gain of three. Now, if we have a gain of three, if I feed a one volt peak to peak signal in here, so at this point, the signal generator is going to be putting out one volt peak to peak at this point, and it's just gonna be fixed at that. I'm gonna leave that there. If we have a gain of three, we should have how many volts here? Very simple, three volts peak to peak. If it's doing that, the thing's doing math. So we're actually setting the gain, 10K, 30K right here. So to doubly make sure that this thing is working correctly, I'm gonna remove this 30K resistor. I'm gonna put a 100K resistor here. That will give us a gain of what? A gain of 10. If we have a gain of 10, there's one volt peak to peak here. We should have 10 volts peak to peak here. Just that easy. If it works with these combinations, we know this op amp is doing its job. I have both my signal generator and my oscilloscope attached to the op amp. Both 300 volt supplies are on right now, so there's 600 volts across that op amp. Let's see if it does math correctly. So we'll take a look at the oscilloscope screen. So the upper channel is the input and the lower one is the output. So we wanna keep an eye on the peak to peak voltage here and the peak to peak voltage there. So I'll turn up the signal generator and I'll bring the input to about one volt. Mm, that was close. Bring it down just a bit, close enough. So channel one peak to peak voltage is 1.01 volts and the output is 3.02 volts. Now, of course, this can be trimmed up with two regulated power supplies. Again, one power supply isn't regulated and they're both not at 300 volts. So you can see already this is working. Again, the input resistor is 10K, feedback resistor is 30K. That gives us a gain of three. One volt peak to peak equals three volts peak to peak. It's doing math just fine. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove that 30k resistor. I'm going to put a 100k resistor in there. And then 1 volt peak to peak should equal 10 volts peak to peak. And we definitely know it's doing math correctly. I've installed the 100k ohm resistor now. So it's hiding behind these wires right here. So now 1 volt peak to peak should give us 10 volts peak to peak output. So let's see how well this op amp performs. Again, keeping an eye on the input and output peak to peak voltages. So I'll raise the signal generator amplitude here. Look at how close that is. 1.01, 10.1. That is extremely close. So if I bring this to 1.1 volts, that should be 11 volts out. Look at that, 1.1. So 1.13, 11.3. Look at how close that is. Again, the power supplies are not exactly at 300 volts, so perfectly set 300 volt supplies, I bet you this thing would be spot on. Big thumbs up for this one. Wow, that op amp is working incredibly well. What I'll do is I'll move around the bias control and you'll see how it'll shift the output here. So that's basically what that does, the bias adjustment. So channel two right now is DC coupled, and that's the reason that we're seeing this as I'm moving that bias. Just for the fun of it, let's check out this op amp's maximum amplitude. So here we go. Let's say right about there is just before distortion. Look at that, an op amp with an output of 155 volts peak to peak. Now that's my kind of op amp. It's working really well. 15 volts, 155. So you basically look at this as 15.5 volts. 155 volts, still working, just perfect, right at the top. No regulated supply on the negative side or anything. Very impressed with this device. Should make for some neat future project at any rate. Thanks for stopping by the lab today. I hope you enjoyed this video involving this vacuum tube op amp. If you did enjoy the video, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more episodes coming like this in the near future. We'll be taking a look at vacuum tube and solid state electronics alike. There'll also be a lot of repairs, restorations, and some troubleshooting tips as well. So if you haven't subscribed, you might want to do that now as well. If you're interested in taking your electronics knowledge to the next level and learning electronics in a very different and effective way, you might want to check out my Patreon page. I'll have the link just below this video in the description, and I'll also pin the link at the top of the comments section as well. So if you click on the link, it'll take you right there. It's a really great community, and there's a lot of really interesting builds going on there right now. So until next time, take care. Bye for now.